nicely. Al and Sandy Pearson are celebrating 51 years of marriage today. And that's a wonderful thing. If you know, last year they took their kids and grandkids with them to Colorado to celebrate their 50th anniversary. And if you follow them on Facebook, all those photos have been starting to show back up in the feed where they were out in Colorado in the mountains and, and all the fun that they had together as a family. And so we're celebrating that, certainly. Um, we are also having an annual meeting next Friday here at church and would invite you to come and join that. You don't have to be a, a member to come to the annual meeting. Anybody is welcome. Uh, we will practice social distancing there, but uh, and invite you to come on out. And that lets you hear what we're doing, where we're at as a church. We talk about the programs, the finances, and all the other things that are going on. Talk some about the future. And uh, it's, a, it's a good meeting. It's usually a fairly relatively short meeting, uh, but it's a great chance for you to uh, come and, and share and to be part of and to give influence on what we do as a church. Um, the other things we do want to ask Libby, who is Gloria Carlson's sister. Many of you know Gloria had a stroke a few weeks back. Uh, Libby called me. They, they put Gloria back in the hospital, and they expect her to be there probably Monday and Tuesday. And many of our church families have been providing them meals. And Libby said, please, please. Don't bring any more food for a few days. <laughs> you guys have overwhelmed them with food. And Libby said, with Gloria not there, and I'm going to visit her at the hospital, I'm not going to be able to eat much. We already have a freezer full. We already have a fridge full. She said, don't bring anything over for a few days, if you would. Uh, she asked me specifically. She said, ask your church people. Tell them, thank you. We're blessed. We appreciate immensely your blessing. So she says, thank you for both her and Gloria. But also... If we could hold off for a few days, uh, Libby said that would actually be helpful right now. So please um, don't bring any food over to Gloria and Libby this week. Um, the other thing I do want to uh, mention, and we're going to be praying about this in a moment as, as Matt comes up here shortly. Uh, just keep the Swanson family in prayers. Dan had a cousin pass away here this week. Uh, it would be Joe and Gloria Co Cobley's son. And many of you know them. Uh, what's that? Or his wife, I'm sorry, it was his wife. His wife, I'm sorry. Um, yes, his wife passed away this week. And so keep the Swanson family in your prayers with that. And uh, that one was late enough we didn't get that into the bulletin. And so I uh, would appreciate your prayers along with that. Well, with that, I'm going to invite Matt to come on up. And he's going to lead us in a time of prayer. If you don't know about it, we've got a prayer wall over here that you can always write prayers on. You can submit prayers online on our church's website. Uh, there's a, a whole page there where you can send, and it comes to me. Those prayers come to me directly, and I'm the only one who sees it. If you mark on the website that you'd like it shared, then I will share it with the prayer team. Matt and Ruth and some of the others are on a prayer team that gather, whether in person or online, every Friday, and they pray for you, they pray for me, they pray for our church, for our community. So there's lots of ways to access prayer in our church. If you ever need prayer, give us a call, send us a note, get online, contact one of our prayer team members, and we would love uh, to pray for you. Because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that we can connect with our God. Our God is a relational God, and it's our joy to be able to pray for you, with you, and over you. And so with that, uh, the floor is yours, Matt. Good morning, Glory. It's nice to be back. Um, we've got a few prayer requests from our prayer wall. Um, some general requests that the power of the Holy Spirit will be in our lives. That we'd have peace, patience, joy, kindness, and love. And also a request for our government leaders as they go through all of these decisions they have to make and the unrest that they are trying to deal with. Um, also be praying for Vicki and Mark Daniels daughter Shelley she'll be expecting a baby soon um, you can be continue to pray for Gail and Russ it's good to see you guys um, Dave Jensen and Dan Madura and also many of our glory family families were um, some of us have been exposed to COVID-19 that the Lord would just protect and heal um, be praying for our uh, Ukrainian brother Josh Tokar, as he's dealing with cancer over in Ukraine, that you would give doctors wisdom there and that the Lord would bring healing um, as he's dealing with that. 
So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are the king of creation, that you are on your throne. Uh, all of the crazy things that we've been dealing with this year have not uh, shaken that reality. Um, you are still Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we can come to you as not only our Lord, but as our Father. That you've taken the sin problem that was between us and you and fixed it through your son Jesus, paying the penalty for our sin on the cross and wrapping us in his righteousness. So we thank you that we can come to you with these requests and ask that you would take care of them. We ask that you'd take care of our family members here at Glory that are dealing with illnesses that you would be with uh, Gloria, especially right now as she's at the hospital. We ask that you'd bring her comfort, help her to uh, just continue to trust in you, that this hardship would um, give her a deeper trust in you, and that you would um, just give Libby wisdom in how to care for her as well. We ask that you'd help her to recover and that she'd be able to be back home soon. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of new life that are in our church family with the herds and the cousins. We ask that you would bless them as they welcome their little ones into the family and get situated to the new normal of having one more. We thank you for those blessings. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with the Swanson family and the Copley family as they mourn the loss of um, a family member, that you would bring comfort and that you would help um, help people trust in you more that might be wavering and those who haven't trusted in you lord may this be a time for them to hear the hope of your gospel and lord as we now hear your word preached we ask that you'd be with pastor chris fill him with your holy spirit may you be glorified in all that is proclaimed in jesus name amen thank you Matt. Well, as I had mentioned last week, it's, at least for me, it's good to be here. And I am glad to see all of you, and I thank you for taking time out of your week, whether it's in person or online, to join us as we dig into the Word of God. We're going to be in Genesis 2, so if you have a Bible, uh, feel free to grab that out. We're going to be in Genesis 2. I will read the passages for you as well, and uh, if you don't own a Bible, let us know. We can certainly get you a Bible if you don't have a Bible to take home or have one at home. Our church loves to provide Bibles for you, and uh, it's a blessing to have incredibly generous people in our church who provide for us so that we can do that. We get to give Bibles away all the time. I give them to kids and all sorts of others. We have a uh, a couple of Gideons in our church, actually two of them in attendance today for that rat matter, and uh, they love to give away Bibles. There's a bunch of us who love to give away Bibles. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so if you ever find someone that you know who doesn't have a Bible that we could be a blessing to, uh, we have some Bibles here. Feel free to take those and, and bless them with it or let me know, and I'll do my best to make sure we get the Word of God into their hands because um, we believe that there is indeed uh, a transformative power in the Word of God, and, and uh, we look forward to being able to provide that for anybody who might have those needs. Well, as I said, we're going to be in Genesis 2, and, and last week we looked at the original relationship between God and Adam in paradise and said that that relationship was filled with both privileges as well as obligations. In, in paradise, God entered into a, a special relationship uh, with Adam. And, and then God spells out the nature of that relationship. There are, are certain things that, that Adam is required to do, and, and there are certain positive obligations entailed in, in his being in relationship with God. And then there are, are certain things which he is to refrain from doing. And as we know, in particular, he's not supposed to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so we talked about uh, the importance of that covenant, the, the covenant of creation, that covenant of life, or, or as we were talking about last week, the covenant of works, right? And today I, I want to turn our attention to the next portion uh, of the scriptures there. It's the last of the creation ordinances, and, and this is where we get marriage. 
So I'm going to begin reading in Genesis 2.18, and I'm going to read on through 25 at the end of Genesis 2 there. And uh, you're welcome to follow along, and we'll throw it up on the screen here. And there it reads, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made it into a woman and, and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Now today, as we have done over the last uh, few weeks, I just want to concentrate on, on one thing in that passage, and, and, and that is this ordinance of marriage, which is like the other creation ordinances that we've been talking about. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous blessing and a tremendous responsibility. And as you look at, at chapter 2 in Genesis, you see God heaping blessings upon Adam, right? And the culmination of those blessings, which he gives to Adam while he's still in paradise, right? This is pre-fall. The, the culminating pinnacle blessing that Adam receives from God is marriage, right? It's that relationship which God grants to Adam in the creation and provision of Eve. It's the, the final, the crowning blessing we find there in verse 18. And then again in 21 through 23. And there, as we read this passage, we see God knows our inherent need for intimacy and for companionship, that we need to be in connection and relationship with someone else. And he knows that because he created us. And he sees that need in Adam. And so there, then, he creates woman. And this marriage is, is viewed then as the, the crowning blessing of God's goodness to man in the original creation. Now let me say uh, briefly in passing before we look at the passage in more detail, it's not surprising, is it, that since this is the crowning blessing of God in God's creation to Adam and to mankind, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that it is precisely here that this is the arena that, that Satan often attacks when he comes to tempt us. And it isn't a surprise then that this is where Satan attacks when he comes and he tempts Eve and Adam at the fall. And so it shouldn't surprise us today then when Satan uh, comes and his first base of attack is to attack marriages. And attack them precisely at the point of God's greatest blessing in relationship, Satan comes and attacks and attempts to, to bring it down. So that's been happening since the beginning of time, and it shouldn't surprise us when it happens to us in our relationship and marriage and in our world today. So let's look at what God says about the ordinance of marriage in verses 18 through 25. And if you're following along in your notes, this will be your first one. The first thing we see in this passage is that God himself, in his good providence, recognized this, this social need of man even in paradise. So God has created us for relationship. You've heard me say this many times over the years. God has created us for relationship, right? Even in paradise, even before there was sin, right? Perfect Adam has a need for companionship. 
If you're following along, look at verse 18. We learn this principle there. It says, then the Lord God said it is not good for a man to be alone, right? I will make him a helper suitable for him. You see, as we've been talking about in creation, everything in the world was good, right? Can you imagine that? Frankly, I can't. I live in a broken world. I'm a broken man living in a broken world. And, and the concept of a perfect world, I really can't conceive of, right? I wish I could. I can kind of imagine a little bit, but I'm sure my imagination falls woefully short of how awesome the garden was before sin entered in. And when God created the world and everything was good, but, but even with everything in the world being good, right? God had pronounced it all as to be good. Even with everything being good, it doesn't occur until later on that Adam has this need. The need is not wrong. It is not bad. And in fact, it's an opportunity for God to bless him. And God, having created everything perfectly, looks at man with compassion and, and, and sees him without a companion. And he says, we got to do something about that, right? It's not good for him to be alone. This has got to be remedied. We can fix that. So, so solitary fellowship with God, even in paradise, isn't God's plan for mankind. Because if we were solitary, if we were alone, if, if we didn't have relationship outside of ourself, it, that, that would go to ignore the basic human need for companionship. And so here God senses the need for man, and he, he has this need for companionship. And so God says, I can provide for it. Now let me remind you of a, a few things that we learn even from this. In the New Testament, Jesus himself draws on this teaching of, about marriage and, and on appropriate relationships between men and women from this passage. When the Pharisees come to Jesus and, and they're arguing over the, the law of Moses and, and, and says, what do we do with this, Jesus? We want your ruling. What is your opinion on this, right? And if you know the Pharisees, they were constantly trying to get Jesus to you know, say something he shouldn't say, to trip him up, to trick him, to, to catch him in something, right? And so they come to him... Uh, with this question about divorce and remarriage and the relationships between a husband and a wife. And, and what does Jesus do in, in that setting? Do you remember? He always takes them right back to Genesis 2. Because the foundations for marriage are found in this passage. And these are still culturally relevant issues for us today, right? The issue of appropriate male-female role relations, the issue of relationships between husbands and wives, the issues of divorce and remarriage, they're all still issues in our society. This hasn't gone away. This has been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It's not new to us. The, the Bible is incredibly wise. There's nothing new under the sun, right? We, we continue to have struggle and strife in our relationships. We continue to have problems with this. Just as there was problems at Jesus' time, just as there was problems at Moses' time, there's still problems in our time. And I want you to note here that God says in the second half of verse 18 that he's going to provide a helper suitable for Adam, right? Watch that phrase, because that phrase is going to occur again in verse 20, a, a, help, a helper suitable. And I think that that phrase, that, that helper suitable, beautifully captures the woman's role and, and, and the dignity in it simultaneously. Because you see here, it, it says that she's a helper, right? And, and that's been abused, certainly, by certain people over history. And it says that, that she is a helper, but she is a helper suitable, right? She is perfectly correspondent. And so the, the phrase stresses both her role, but as well her dignity. Not just one or the other, but both simultaneously. And I want to add and, and make sure you hear here 
The helper doesn't mean the junior assistant flunky, right? That's not what the wife was supposed to be. The word helper, when you read this in the scripture, is the very same word which is used when the Lord God over and over in the Old Testament again said things like, the Lord is my help. Would you say the Lord is my second class assistant flunky? I sure hope not. Would you, would you call God a, a lesser vessel or being lesser humanity because he's our help? No, absolutely not. So when the, the Bible refers to Eve as a suitable helper, it's in no way trying to demean her or put her as a lesser than Adam. That's not the intent of Scripture. It's the very same word it speaks of when it speaks of God as our helper. She is a picture of God coming to the aid and rescue of man. So, so remember that, ladies, when you're having difficulty with us men, right? Maybe you're having a struggle with your husband. Not that that ever happens with me. I'm, you know, I am husband of the year material every single year, right? Trophy husband. They just haven't made a trophy big enough quite yet. Maybe not. But when you're dealing with us, ladies, when we've been difficult, when we're challenging to you, when we aren't showing you appreciation for your labors, remember that in that relationship as you love your husband. Picture yourself as you are God's divine aid to that idiot. I'm that idiot, right? You are the divine aid. You are the blessing suitable to us or to him. And what an awesome picture that you can be as you love others, as you aid others. What a, a wonderful, beautiful picture of Christ's love you can be. It's an awesome position of responsibility and authority that God has given to you women in the relationship of marriage. So don't ever feel and don't ever allow yourself to feel lesser than, because you are certainly not. Now this passage clearly focuses on, by the way, on companionship as the basic need which woman is going to fulfill for men. And, and for some of us men, again, I digress, you'd almost think we're uncompanionable, right? I, I am an introvert by nature. Um, I, I, I can certainly go for long periods of time without lots of social interaction, which you may find weird if you follow me on Facebook. Right? But Facebook is at a distance. It's not in person. And, and, and in here, this passage shows that you are a blessing to us in companionship, even to weirdos like me who are a little bit standoffish in our relationships. Notice again in verse 19 and verse 20 here. We learn a, a second thing about this ordinance. There we learn that, that God has simultaneously made Adam aware of his need for companionship, and then he allowed Adam to express his dominion in the naming of the animals. In verses 19 and 20, God has brought all of the animals to Adam for the purpose of his naming them, right? And, and that naming of the animals demonstrates that, that man is this overseer of all that he surveys under God. And, and, and I think that's a broad man, not just Adam, it's mankind, man. And, and in this naming and, and Adam's dominion are connected. As he gives the names, it shows that, that he has this dominion, this, this authority over the animals of the world. We use naming in kind of a, a similar way, if you actually think about it. My wife and I were having a conversation about this, actually, uh, earlier this week, 
Um, we, we were talking about cultural relative, cultural events relative to our times and, and how things get named and how things are taken down into history. And I have a degree in history. Many of you may know that. I have a BA in history. I once upon a time thought I was going to be a history teacher, and instead I'm a, a Bible history teacher, I guess. But uh, uh, one of the things is that we see frequently is history is defined by the victor, right? By the ones who win the war. Those who win the war are the ones who generally get to name the battles, right? Napoleon, you know Napoleon from the war, France and Europe, right? Napoleon didn't get to name Waterloo because he lost, right? Wellington got to name Waterloo. And in fact, Wellington's allies, the ones who fought with him, didn't even get to vote. He named it. And where the name comes from is rather cheeky, if you, if you know the history, because uh, Otto von Blücher, who was the Prince of Bismarck, who was the German leader, uh, leader of the, the Prussian army of the time, he helped Wellington greatly, right? Arguably won the Battle of Waterloo for him. And so this guy comes in because he, you know, thinks that, well, my troops are the ones that kind of tipped it. I might get to name this battle. And he comes in and, and he suggests that, well, maybe we should call this the La Belle Alliance, right? Which means the good alliance. Wellington looked at him and said, no, we're not going to call it that. We're going to call it Waterloo because the English won't like a French name, right? And he... He got to make that call because he was the overall bigwig leader at the top of the heap. Even though there was other towns that were closer that they could have named it after, they said, no, we're going to pick Waterloo. And this is true, too, when you think of things like New Amsterdam, right? When you studied history, you remember that growing up? We had the city called New Amsterdam, right? On the coast, east coast. Is it still there today? Yeah. Is it still called New Amsterdam? No. Does anybody know why it's not called New Amsterdam anymore? Well, when the Dutch had control and were an authority, <coughs> it was New Amsterdam, right? And then the English come in. And they look at it and go, we don't want Amsterdam. We're English. York. This is the new one. Right? Welcome to New York. And there it is, still today. When God shows his closeness of relationship to Jacob, I want to go biblical. And he wants to show the change in, in Jacob's nature. What's he do? He renames him Israel. Showing not only God's lordship over Jacob, but his blessing upon him, right? So naming functions like this often in the Bible, and, and it's a way that it shows dominion and authority. And now this act of naming male and female paired with the animals over and over again reminds Adam as he goes through and says, these are horses, those are elephants, got a couple of lions, I wish he would have squashed those mosquitoes. And he, he's, he's naming all the animals, right? And Adam's doing that. And every time God brings him an animal, giraffe, monkey, there's two of them, a male and a female. Adam's like, this is just me. There's two squirrels, there's two goats, two bats, and there's me, right? And the very act of, of naming the animals is almost like a, a, a little divine nudge here. The way of God to say, look at them, there's nobody else out there like you. You were created for relationship. You need companionship. 
And that is, like I said earlier, a hint that sometimes we still need today as men. And at any rate, in this passage, the phrase, a suitable helper, means that God has given him a perfect fit. And he looks, and there's not a suitable helper. It was not found. There was no perfect fit for Adam. There was no one there to, to, to be his counterpart. There was no one to be his honored mutual companion. And so God says, I can fix that. I, I, can, I can do something with this, right? And so the third thing then that we see in this passage in verses 21 through 23 is that God makes provision for this need. God doesn't say, Adam, you need a companion. Go find one, right? Scour the earth. Walk the garden. Look everywhere. See where I found it. See where, see, see where you know, maybe I hid one. I forgot about it, right? Well, God doesn't forget. He doesn't tell Adam to go seeking his own companionship. God himself makes provision for this need. And God does this, and then man gratefully acknowledges to perfection in God's gift to him. Notice in this passage several things. First of all, man is formed from the ground. We talked about this last week, right? Sometimes we hear from the world that we've evolved from monkeys, or we evolved from fish, or dolphins, or whales, or giraffes, or I don't know, whatever. I probably evolved from a hippopotamus, maybe. But I'm big and I smell, you know. I get it. But uh, you look at that and you go, okay, I, I don't know if I want to agree with that. But the Bible is even more humbling than that, frankly, right? The Bible says, you're dirt, right? The Bible says God scooped up some dirt, <gasps> created life. We were created from dirt. More humble and, and lowly even than a, a monkey, right? And then so we got this, this man, Adam, formed from the ground. And then Eve, she's formed from him. Paul stresses that this is a very significant in this relationship between man and woman, especially between husbands and wives, when he points this out in, in 1 Timothy 2.13. And it's also pointed out not only in Genesis 2, but also in 1 Corinthians 11. You hear some of these passages whenever you go to to a wedding, right? 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. That the woman was made for man for, for to be a help to him, a suitable helper to him. And notice that it also stresses, if you know those passages in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7, then it says there in the New Testament that, that Eve is the crown and the glory of Adam. She is the glory of Adam. And man stands in need of her. And then 1 Corinthians 11, 11, and 12, it continues on, on that train of thought. So this is a beautiful, wonderful thing that God has blessed us with. And it's important that we understand as we, we study this, and I want you to notice this, as you're, as you're reading through this passage, notice that when does God make a helper for Adam? What's he do? Adam goes to sleep, right? Adam is sleeping while the woman is made so that Adam could never take any credit for its creation. There's no suggestions that Adam gets to put into it, right? Adam doesn't get to say, make her like this. Give her this personality. Make her look like this. No. God creates her. God brings women into being. And then, of course, Adam then, as he comes to, gets, he does name her, and he names her woman, man and woman. And that is, even in itself, a beautiful part of the story. If you, if you know the original words, he is Ish, and she is Isha. Adam, man. Man. There's a compatibility even in the language used in the Bible to describe this story. There's a mutuality about them. And at the same time, 
that relationship shows the structure and authority that God has worked in his ordering of the world. It shows her equality and her compatibility with him. The woman is presented wholly as man's partner and as his counterpart. Nothing is yet said about her, her, her childbearing, right? We haven't gotten to that part. She is valued for herself alone. And, and I think that's incredibly important in the world today when, you know, I'll, I'll meet with people and I, I've got friends and family who struggled with things like fer infertility, right? And, and, and particularly as women, and I've experienced this with people in my life, when women are unable to have children, some women really struggle with that. They almost feel as if a, they're, they're, they're incomplete, like a, a portion of their being can't be. But even here, the Bible is specific and clear. That it's not fertility that makes a woman valuable to her husband. It's her and her alone. She in and of herself is valuable to her husband regardless of whatever other procreative blessings God showers on that family. This giving in this passage is a wonderful thing that God gives a woman to Adam, right? We have an echo of this in our, our modern wedding ceremonies. I got a call just last week. One of my students, now I've been here for four years, but one of my students from Wasika, Minnesota, called me and said, Pastor, there's nobody on the planet I would like to do my wedding more than you. I said, we've got a new pastor, you know, we like him, but I want you. And I'll say that in a way to brag, only in the way to to bring up that in this ceremony, when, whenever that happens, because it's next summer, and it's a ways down the road yet, but when we get to that ceremony, there's going to be a part where the bride is walked down the aisle by her father, right? I remember that from my own wedding. Standing there, waiting. All of a sudden, everybody stood up, and I knew time had come, right? I couldn't see because there's people lining the aisles. I can't see my wife. Well, not yet my wife, but my to-be wife and her father, but I know they're there now, right? And you get that anticipation in your gut as a man, you know, all right. There's no turning back. Here we are. Let's go with it. And that father, my father-in-law, Bill, comes walking down the aisle, ear to ear grin. This is the only daughter. It's the only time he's going to get to do this. Ear to ear grin. Escorting my wife down to me. And when a father walks his daughter down that aisle and presents him to the man who is to become her husband, we see in that just a, a glimpse there of God presenting Adam with his wife. The Father comes presenting a blessing. I assure you, when I was getting married and my father-in-law was giving me his daughter, so to speak, I had no idea what blessings came with that. I'm sure Adam, when he receives Eve, has no idea what a blessing that is. You ever catch that at a wedding? That that's an image of God giving man to woman. Look at verses twenty-three and twenty-four. We see there a fourth thing about this marriage ordinance. There in these verses, we see that that God, in in this special creative and providential act, actually creates and establishes the foundation of marriage. And it's for this reason that we read there. A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined with his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And, and this provision of Eve to Adam, according to both Moses and Christ, is the foundation of all marriage. You can look at this if you want. You can follow along. You can open it up to Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. And there Jesus 
speaking and, and, and precisely speaking about and explaining the foundations of marriage. What is the reason? Because God made woman for man and out of man, and therefore it is to be the closest of all relationships. It is the, the greatest of the creational blessings. And, and the parameters which God places around marriage are to be the foundation for this relationship in all of life, both before as well as after the fall. And we have to understand that, that marriage within that, what a blessing it is. Because truly, as an institution, marriage is troubled in our society. There's all sorts of pressures on it, right? A lot of pressures come from expectations and from selfishness. It can be very destructive in marriage. When a young couple gets married, right, when they, they come together, if the young woman sees the man as the answer to all of her needs, and the man sees the woman as the answer to all of his needs, they go into that relationship, right? They go into that marriage thinking that the other one is going to fulfill all of their needs. And that's disastrous. If you go into a marriage thinking that someone else is going to fix you or provide the needs for you, rather than going into a marriage with an attitude of self-sacrifice, and a spirit of self-denial, uh, a spirit to uh, be determined to serve the other, if you go into a relationship like that expecting the other to complete you, those very expectations on your marriage can oftentimes lead to collapse and destruction. We, of course, have other pressures as well. And while it's not the, the focus of the message today, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak clearly in one other area briefly about what is the, the biblical definition of marriage, right? That's a whole sermon in and of itself for some other time. But I think that it pretty clearly throughout the Bible that it defines marriage as, as one man and one woman. Were there other arrangements and relationships in the Bible? Yes, there certainly were. And none of them were to be normative, and none of them came with this blessing from God. But hear me and hear me very clearly in that. That's not the end of the discussion. Because far too frequently, I have seen Christians be our own worst enemy on this subject. Far too frequently, I see Christians being unloving and uncharitable to those who do not follow Christ and do not find marriage as we define marriage. And I have to tell you, that's not helping us win them to Christ. So please, even when you disagree, even if you disagree strongly, do so lovingly. We can dig into that further in some other time. Finally, in verse 25 here, Moses reminds us that there was no sin in the relationship between Adam and Eve, and therefore there was no shame in this stage of human experience. Right? The Bible says, the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. There was no sin. There was no shame. No barriers to relationship with one another. No barriers to the relationship with God. The need for, for covering is a result of the fall. And that covering that we have is a symbolic representation of the mediation that we need between us and God. So it's a, a practical and moral sign this need that we have for modesty today. And it came because of the fall. In the garden, Adam and Eve were perfect, right? Their bodies had no flaws. There was no fear that they would disappoint the other. No worries about maybe a flaw they need to hide. Adam didn't have to wear black because he thought it made him look slim. Right? Eve didn't wear leggings because she was worried about what her thighs looked like. Neither of them were worried if they had a double chin. And they weren't worried about those things. It was perfect. 
They had nothing to hide. And catch this, and I want to close with this idea. God wants to have the same kind of relationship with us. God wants that very same relationship with us where we have nothing to hide, right? Where we're not worried about disappointing him, where we're not trying to hide something from him. Because that, frankly, is one of the blessings of having been reconciled through Christ. We've been reconciled with our Father God. We don't have to run. We don't have to hide. We don't have to cover ourselves up in our relationship with God. We don't have to let our, our sin define us and drag us down. And, and just as God provided a covering for Adam and Eve, so he has done for you and for me. But for us, it's a covering of our sin so that we can stand before him as redeemed, not condemned, as free, not burdened by sin and shame. And if we are in Christ, then one day we too will get to walk in the garden of the new heaven and the new earth, fully restored in our relationship for all of eternity. And I want that for each and every one of you. And I pray that you have that and that you want it too. That's God's intent for each and every one of us. To be restored in perfect relationship. Let's pray. God, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, for your love, for the joy that we get from digging into your word. And I pray, God, that as we do this, that we would humbly come to your word and, and submit ourselves to it. That as we read through sometimes challenging passages in the Bible, Lord, that nonetheless, we would say, your will, not mine, be done. And God, that can be hard for us because we want our way. We want our way in all of our relationships. Sin has entered in and, and it's made us selfish, all of us, every one of us at times. We don't always think of others first. We don't always try to love and serve as you loved us. First, God, we, we ask for your forgiveness when we fail. We ask for your wisdom to ask forgiveness of others when we fail. And we humbly submit, God, that we will continue to need you in this time to help shape us and transform our hearts that we might be more servant-like in all of our relationships, but particularly in marriage, Lord. And God, you've created all of us for relationship. Not all of us will be married or are married, and I understand that fully. And that doesn't mean that those who, who aren't married are cursed in any way, Lord God. That's not at all what the Bible implies. And God, I just pray for all of us that we would have close companionship and relationship, those we are connected to, those we are accountable to, those we can love and serve. And then in that, God, may we model your love to the world. May we make much of you in all of our relationships. Truly, God, you are good and you have blessed us abundantly and amazingly. We thank you and praise you, God, for all of the offerings that have been given uh, online, in person, the tithes, the offerings, and just pray your blessing upon them today, Lord, that you would multiply them in ways that we cannot, that they could do the work of your will, both here locally as well as across the globe. And God, as we continue to go forth into the world, may we go forth loving our neighbor, putting them above self, finding ways in that to share your love, to shine your light into the world. Lord, lead us in that, that we might continue to bring you all the glory, honor, and praise. We thank you. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' high, holy, and beautiful name, amen. Once again, I am truly blessed and thankful to be able to worship with you, whether it's in person or online. And if we can pray for you, if we can bless you, if we can love you, if we can serve you from here at Glory Baptist Church, please let us know because it would be our delight and our joy to do so. And please believe her, she'll be blessed. There we go.
And as you go, go forth with the power of God to love and serve and bless and do amazing things to his glory. Go and serve your king. Wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. And I'm so glad I got to see you today. I hope to see you again soon. God bless everyone.